Hustle nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. You know, my dad walk on. Hey, man. Hey, man. We got a special guest here today, man. This guy don't need no introduction, man. Y'all done seen him, man. He always working. You know what mm. I'm saying? My guy Smooth Vegas in the building. What up? What yeah, up, man? I'm just here, man. Thank I, you for coming. Man, I fuck with the setup, bro. This shit hard. For real, man. Yeah, you yeah, like yeah, it, yeah. man? It sounds real crisp. When, <laughs> <laughs> That's why when he sat down, he said, yo, yo, y'all on Spotify? Yeah, he heard it. He heard that Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> that nigga heard the Joe Rogan on a million dollar movie. Say, yo, yo, man, the quality, the quality, I think at times people like, like they overlook the quality aspect of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he was just saying off camera right now, he's like, ain't nobody fuck with my shit unless unless it's Breakfast Club. So mm-hmm. you seen it, then you like, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, he, he gassed it. And as soon as I put it on, I was like, oh, this shit got to <laughs> <laughs> No, I just, I, just, I, I just know that, man, uh, the layout, the way you, uh, you know, the way that you come into the game, man, if you don't respect it, who going to respect it? You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? So, man, um, just... Uh, we always like to go back a little bit in the backstory, man, before Smooth Vega, man, like just coming up early beginning, humble beginnings, man. <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you start out at and just how did you even get in to be, before you became Smooth Vega, uh, what was it like? Uh, I guess, you know, like, it, it's so funny, like, I, I did an event last year and the whole, the whole thing, the whole, like, basis of the event was revolved around uh, paying tribute to my mother, right? And my mother used to own an independent record shop in North Fort Worth, and I was raised in this independent record shop from the time I was born up to the time that I was 11 or 12 years old. I didn't really realize until I was in the middle of the promotion of the event that my hustle, my entrepreneurship, and my love for the music really, that's where it was born at. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I guess in a sense, if you want to know the beginning, that is the beginning. My mom owned an independent record shop that sold predominantly Spanish music, mm-hmm. but it also acted like a blockbuster. You know, back in the day, people used to mm-hmm. rent movies and mm-hmm. shit. Like, mm-hmm. So we used to rent American and Spanish uh, movie titles. Okay. So that's kind of the beginning of everything. And, and you then, worked in there? Yeah. yeah. Ch- child labor laws. <laughs> you know, no, but yeah, we, we, uh, me and my brother used to be there, and we spent really like a lot of time there. Okay. So I, I got an opportunity to see the hustle, and for me, more than anything, being in that environment really like I guess now that I look back on it like that was the it origin of everything everything that I am like really started there from your mom yeah from the shop you know what I'm saying <laughs> from the shop so oh. where is your dad during this time mm-hmm. where was your dad during this time he was working at 9 to 5 9 to 5 she was the independent business owner I always I, used, I always tell people like, oh I got my I got my mother's heart but I got my father's hustle and I'm thinking in my head like well shit like my dad is a hard worker he's still alive mm-hmm. to this day my mom passed away in 2009 but she was the one that owned her own business. Right. And at that time, being, you know, an independent business owner, her being a Mexican immigrant, and her, you know, starting her own business and running a, a successful business for 12 years in the heart of the stockyards in North Fort Worth, it's really unprecedented, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, because, like, her only competitors for so long were, like, Blockbuster. And eventually there was another business that came along, but she held her own for, uh, for as long as she could. So, like, growing up, you know, there was, like, I was exposed to both, Spanish music and English music. My brother's the one that introduced me to hip hop, though. So, wow. You know, looking through your page, man, on Instagram, man, it's like watching uh, the BET Awards, nigga. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, I mean, nigga, you you fly as hell. You know why? How, how, how the hell are you meeting all these people? Then I told you earlier, yeah. I'm not impressed because you you know you Hispanic. <laughs> Hispanics and white don't have to work as hard uh, as the black guy. Know you know what I'm saying? Literally. You niggas can get in places, take a camera and a few friends, <laughs> and it's you in to the end. You know no, what I'm you, saying? No, but you know what, though? I don't necessarily agree with you because I always tell people that with, with Hispanics and hip-hop, sp- sp- specifically Latinos, right? I always used to say, like, to me, people look at us the way that we look at people calling uh, Taco Bell authentic Mexican food. We just don't feel like it's real Mexican food. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I feel at times when they see somebody coming in, that's not black, that's in hip hop, that's really, you know, going out there trying to make a name for himself or really working hard, they don't necessarily view it like it's authentic. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's how I feel. So Man, that's my know, perspective. I, I, I'm you know not I mean? Hispanic, so I can't really just <laughs> claim to know what you're talking about. It just seemed to me like the lighter you get, the easier it gets sometimes. I mean, maybe I'm tripping. Mm-hmm. And that go for you too. We go through. Oh, yeah, like- <laughs> No, we we, we 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 go through our own struggles. though. we do. 
We go through our own struggles. Make no mistake about it. Man, man I believe know. it, man. I'm just giving y'all hell. I gotta I do that. That's a, that yeah. what make me sit over here. Yeah. You just so say, I might say anything. You know. You, you got it out for light skins. Is what it is. <laughs> you either love them or hate them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, no, but but you met like a lot of people, man. I seen you on a, a deal with Jay Prince, uh, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did how, did, how, did you, how did you make that happen? Because I've been trying to get Jay Prince, man. Uh, what's up? Uh, yeah, yeah. Where you at, man? You know, come on, Jay, man. Come on on the show. Boss Talk 101, what a boss is talk. And I know you're a boss. Hey, man, you got to speak it into existence. I've uh, been working on that. <laughs> so, uh... I have a show as well. For sure. Right? I, I don't really... Now, yeah, get your, get your name of your show. The name of the show is called Not The Beats Experience. I don't okay. actually publish as much content as like D and you and Man, everybody. wait a minute. Wait a minute. First of all, you can't really just compete with the with the God. Okay? <laughs> you can't do what I do because I, I get it out the mud. Yeah. You're no. sitting on the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm saying, like, so I, uh, I had, like, really during the pandemic, you know, everything changed. We weren't really moving around. We weren't able to go in studio and produce any content. So I just got active on emails and I just fucking got a hold of Jay Prince's publicist. I just it just happened by accident to be honest with you. And you know, like, you're the second nigga that came over here talking about it happened by accident. Let me just say that. <laughs> the first one was Jeff Pullum. Shout out to mm -hmm. Jeff Pullum. I, I emailed him and it was like it was an accident and they, <laughs> and they called me back and I got nervous. Listen, man, we don't want to hear that, man. And it just happened. I, give me the game. Let me get no, on in I there, mean, man. I mean, I'm telling you, so he has a publicist by the name of Julia Beverly who used to actually work for, I believe it's the Ozone magazine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's who, who acts as his publicist to this day. And so I just reached out to her and she reached back. She's like, hey, he's in the middle of promoting his liquor at the time. So he was doing media and he was doing press and he just so happened. So it was just the right time. Yeah. Yeah, well, I hope that happened for us. You you get the names and stuff. Let's go in. Okay. All right. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that wasn't the only one, man. You have some bangers. I even seen you one with Life, I believe, oh, by yeah. Jennings. Yeah, that how was did you How did you guys link? Uh, that's just through, you know, so obviously I have a background as a promoter. Okay, you know, so that helps. You know, that. so that's, yeah, exactly, That's help, that helps. And I, uh, I booked a lot of shows with a lot of artists. I've worked with a lot of artists over the years. And he happened to be in town, and I booked his after party. And that, that actually was the second episode I had ever taped. So I was like, yo, would he be down to come in and do an interview? And they're like, yeah, he'll do it. This time to this time, we did it, so. Wow, and 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 I see you all at the, uh, at the. I think you was in Frisco. It looked like you was in Frisco. Oh, you saw <laughs> Nigga, it was in Frisco. How the hell, you and Jerry Jones got a relationship too? How the hell you end up on the field with you know, cameras you know, and, and now you gotta have permits no, for that I, I when you black. I, I when you black? <laughs> No, I, I, Look, no, you're not I, gonna go out there without no permits. See, see, no. see, see, see. You out there probably just I, just bring the cameras in. Nah, man, I wish it was that easy. No, okay. I, I, <laughs> he got it in. I had to actually get permission. No, uh, there was a boxing match that was that was happening, and for me, like, I, I'm really tapped into like the sports world. Like, I like to like know what's going on. So, like, whether it's MMA, pro boxing, whatever the case, and there was a big pro boxing fight that was going on at the Ford. Uh, what is it? Whatever the star at the Ford or whatever the fuck it's called over there in Frisco. Mm -hmm. And so we had to get permission, but the, the promoters actually set that up. Wow. So we came in and we set up a whole podcast set up in the middle of the field. It was dope too. Yeah, yeah. That, that was one of my favorite ones because that's kind of wow. like, that's like a flex. Like not everybody could do some shit. I know, <laughs> that's what I just said. And like, how yeah. long were you doing podcasting before that happened? Uh, well, you know, I think I had experience. Two days. <laughs> <laughs> this nigga ain't that. It don't take hard when you, you Hispanics run Dallas. They blind all the oh, damn shit. jerseys. Jerry Jones, if he talked to him, you're like, they ain't buy all the jerseys. Oh, uh, shit. You know? yeah. No, uh, I had uh, branched off into podcasting in 2009. I did audio for about a year, like a little under a year. And then the production team that I work with, they're like, yo, do you want to put this on camera? I'm like, man, I don't really want to be on camera. You know what I mean? Like, I was cool with just doing phoners because I was doing phone interviews, like over the phone, like, like radio style. Yeah. But yeah, he convinced me and that was it. You know, so I started doing it that way. Wow, that's okay. dope, man. For you to be able to do that, man, and to be uh, you know, uh, uh one And when did this happen in on the The, the Dallas Cowboys, uh -huh. that was the beginning of twenty twenty. Yeah. Twenty twenty. Okay. But to even do it, man, like like nobody yeah, you year. don't see that every day. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think it's 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 partially like the thing that I enjoy the most about formats like this is like it it becomes conversational. So it, like I know when I watch interviews, I enjoy watching interviews, but you know, sometimes like it's so like 
fucking cookie cutter like so by the book like i don't do that and i don't want to do that either so Bro. like I, I like to really dig into like Shout the story out to the niggas that keep saying why you cut him off nigga let me tell y'all <laughs> something right quick we having a hell of a conversation and a good time on boss talk 101 where the bosses talk everybody might be talking at the same time we don't know mm -hmm. so at the end of the day we care about what people think but we, then we don't because we care about keeping it organic keeping it real <laughs> keeping it like a conversation where we going back and forth I don't care. Yeah. I'm not that regular dude. I'm. This ain't the Breakfast Club. This ain't none of them other ones that you watch. This Boss Talk 101. So we might say anything at any time to anybody. And that's why it be crazy. Like, you waiting to talk now, nigga. I see you. You geared up to say something. I see it. Now, she might say something. We don't know. <laughs> well, you can't take yourself too serious. Not at all. This, you know what I mean? Like, you got to have fun. Yeah, yeah. When it, when it becomes too much of the same, it's like, all right. That's, yeah. that's the same thing that has to do with work. Once it, work it becomes not fun anymore, you, you don't want to go. You don't want to do it. Yeah, for sure. So I, I, that's my perspective on all of this, like as far as interviewing. So yeah, I mean, I, but I, that's how I got into it. And I've enjoyed it ever since. I do it when I can. Yeah, yeah, it's fun, man. It's really, a, it's a rush, man, to be able to see the finishing product. So many people think when you sit down here, it's just boom, when it come out, it come out. But it's a lot of work goes into it. It's a lot of, behind the scene editing and all type of stuff to try to make sure that everybody get their just dudes. Yeah, like, sure. like I fucking walk in and I had to like give you my social security number <laughs> or I had to fucking give you my blood type. I had to give you yeah. everything. Yeah, and we still got to do some checks before you leave, nigga. You know? I had to do a fucking physical, you know what I'm so saying? Like, just I, to get on the bike. I was like, yeah, what y'all doing over here? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> different. Yeah, it's different. Hey, you know I like that. But what no. about the the, uh, the Cisco? I seen you with Cisco. Did you interview him or you just took No, care? no, I actually, uh, I interviewed Cisco. Um, that was another extension of me being a promoter. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you do get the perks of being a promoter, but I think th that's just like any other hustle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you got to know how to leverage every resource that you gain. Yeah. In, in this case, like, uh, I think early on, what I didn't mention, the reason why I really branched into podcasting was because, uh, like, K104 and 97, I really, like, Piss me off, you know what I mean? Like, so ah, exclusive That's your motivation, huh? Boss talk oh, exclusive. Get the damn! I got some here, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> nah, what it was is that uh, I think I brought the rapper the game to town, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and I and I think I, I brought him to town. Then I brought uh, Joel Santana, and I want to say Bun B like consecutively, and then I took him to ninety seven nine. Every time I would take him. To, to, to go to do the interview and I'm thinking like it's a good look like I'm building a relationship with the station so they would take the interview they would film the content right they would put them live on air but like they would specifically tell them mind you they're only in town because I'm booking them for the show the only reason they're even coming in is because the promoter is telling them hey plug the show but when they get in the station would tell them like you can't talk about the show because they're not running advertisements with us Right, oh. so it, but it didn't click to me at first because I thought I was being a good host in, in the beginning. Like, oh, you know, it ain't no big deal. Like, I'm getting them the interview. They're gonna look out for me. I'm gonna look out for them. And by the third or fourth interview, I'm realizing like, it's oh, you motherfuckers, me. yeah. Like, oh, I yeah. see what you're doing. And then they would publish the interview or they would put the photo. Like the radio personalities would be like, yeah, ninety-seven nine would. You know the game, yeah. We doing it big. Y'all tune in right now, and then they would not mention anything about the promoter or the right. show. So I was like, "Yo, like, that's a twenty thousand dollar interview." Mm -hmm. and that's the way I'm looking at it because I just paid this guy twenty thousand dollars to be in town or ten thousand dollars to be in town, and like, you're taking the interview. The least you can do is be like, "Check them out tonight across town." Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even if mm -hmm. nobody goes, it's the gesture. Yeah. So when I realized I was doing too much of that, not only with the radio station, but also with like. The, the local media print like the Dallas Observer the Dallas Morning News I was like why am I giving everybody else the interview fuck these people I'm gonna keep them all to myself and you start like, doing interviews. That's how it all. That's how that's it really dope. happened. That's, that's how dope. it really happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a resolve. I'm a, re, I'm a resolve my own issue mm -hmm. within yeah. my own situation and my own power. And now it's gonna also make me a brand. Now he didn't yeah. think of that though when he was doing it. He just thinking <laughs> I'm gonna get the damn interview. <laughs> no, no, but, but it was also to control the narrative because think about it. Like, and, and this is a true story. I got three six Mafia. They're coming in town in, in August, right? I just booked three six. So part of the deal and when. August 6th. <laughs> Them niggas need to be on here, bro. Uh, One of them, I've been talking to Project Pat, but... Oh, Project, I, I got Project Pat coming in on uh, May 6th. I need him on the okay, show. for sure. But for sure with, with, um, with 36 Mafia, like, I worked in the deal to where they, DJ Paul has to give me an interview, even if it's virtual. 
Yeah. So like, if I do the interview, what I'm gonna do is I get to control the interview. I can start the fucking interview. Like, hey, August 6th, they're gonna be in town, whatever, right, whatever. Right. Promoter, tickets, buy, now, right? I could do that and I could control the interview. Whereas if I take them to a radio station or I take them to a, a, a print media or anywhere else, they don't need to talk about it because they're gonna get their content. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where with me, at least I could direct the dialogue. Makes you know sense. what I'm saying? Make, so, make a lot of sense. You know, that's just kind of my way of, and, and, I, and I tried, just for the record, I tried to start like a podcast where I wasn't the personality and I tried to be the guy it didn't that was work. like, it doesn't work out. And then you also control the narrative of when it comes out, so it comes out enough time for, you know, for your show. Yeah, for wow. sure. You want to just control the content. You know, you right. want the whole fucking purpose of everything mm -hmm. you do should be about controlling your narrative. Like, you can't allow anybody to come in and control what you do because you have to own your, your content, own which your is what we're stuff. talking about. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And also, like, in my opinion, like, when I bring an artist into town, you know, I'm not greedy with it. Like, you know, I, I, I don't mind feeding other people and helping other yeah. people out as long as we look out for one another. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, but yeah. in the case of the radio stations, it's like, this is very one-sided. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it wasn't no give and take at the end of the day. And it's not just them, man. There was, like, a, a few local media uh, publications, like, uh, that I gave interviews to, and then when they would publish their local awards, they would nominate everybody but the person that gave them the fucking interviews. Wow. And I, and then I would just kind of do cross-reference, and it's not me being a hater, it's me being realistic. I'm like, yo, like, I mean, what did they do to earn that aside from, you know, whatever? Like, did they do something? Like, was there a favor there? Like, was there a favor system to create that? And there wasn't. So I'm like, yo, so you mean to tell me I just gave this platform these many interviews or this whatever, and you can't even acknowledge me, like, yeah, it sucks. But, it, but, but you know what? But it's cool though because you know what? Like at, at some point or another, you're eventually gonna realize what you're worth. And you know what, man? Go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. I like that. I like that. I think I think that's dope. I think you should definitely uh, understand that you walking in purpose. I got to say that you ain't really just you ain't really just did nothing. Uh, I I believe in God. I know some people you might nah, hang with no. that may not even nah. acknowledge God. <laughs> I believe you know, God. it may be yeah, say yeah. It, I mean, it may be some people that that may you may be hanging around that don't know, don't know what's going on. Yeah. But but I'm a believer, so at the end of the day, I believe you walking in purpose. No, nah, absolutely. And I I think things don't just happen for a reason. So man, kudos to you for figuring it out. A lot of people don't. Well, you know, you know I mean? and I don't think that I always viewed my myself the way other people viewed me and I don't think that I always took like ownership of who I was right like you you realize like oh man like I have these relationships I have these resources I have this know-how I'm thinking it's just common right I'm thinking it's just second nature because that's me but then I'm not realizing like other people view me in a certain way and it took me a very long time to feel comfortable owning that so part of that is the reason why there was a delayed reaction. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like such a delayed reaction person. Like I, I always tell that to people as they get to know me. I'm like, I'm so fucking delayed. Like it'll be like a year and a half later. Like, oh, oh, now I understood what he was talking about. Like, because my mentality is always like, go get it, go get it, go mm -hmm. get it. I'm always getting, I'm always on to the next situation. So I never stop to like process, analyze and assess. I just move, 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 move. And when I stop, that's when I think. And I'm like, Oh, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah, that's so it. Let me ask you a question. So, other than um, the football stadium, which interview, um, which interview, and what event? So it's two different ones. Yeah, would you consider as being your biggest ones you've ever done? Ah, uh, you know what? I would say, like, if you're talking about events or interviews, both. So. What's your biggest event and what's your biggest interview? If you ask me what my biggest event, I'm going to give you the Tom Brady answer. Which one's your favorite ring? The next one, right? So yeah. I'm gonna say the next event is my, my, my biggest event, right? Uh, but in all honesty, looking back, there's a few events that really defined my career or defined my whole hustle, mm -hmm. I guess you would say. The first one had nothing to do with the recording artist. I did an event in 2007. It was actually my second event. And I didn't really know how to structure deals back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, so, you know, now it's pretty common. Like, if you want to do your own event, you can work out a door deal with the venue. And mm -hmm. if you got a good relationship, they'll give you the door. Back then, it wasn't like that. So, the first deal I had ever taken ever was, like, the most ridiculous, like, insane deal ever, which was I asked the guy to pay me $500 to come in and put an event. And there's a whole backstory to it, so I'm just going to get right to it. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I don't want to pay you $500. He said, how about I give you... 40% uh, if you hit 400 people, 
50% if you hit 500 people and 60% if you exceed 500 people. Okay. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm selling tickets for $15. I'm like, well, what do I have to lose? I'll, I'm, I'll exceed the $500 number for sure. But, mm -hmm. you know, let me do this. So I did it. And I actually made, uh, I, I brought in over 600 people. I made over $3,000. So I, at that point, he fucked up because he could have just paid me $500. Right. So now I'm coming in the next time. I'm like, yo, I want 70, 30. There's no, <laughs> no negotiating. So when I went into the next deal, which is the event that I would say really changed my career, it was uh, I came in at 70, 30, and then we drew 1,200 people to that event. And this is at a time where there was no online sales. This is 2007, you know, and... The event made twelve thousand dollars that night, and that was the most money I had ever held in my hands. But I think that was the first time I realized and I recognized, like, oh shit, like, <laughs> like I can make I can make a living off of this. I can make money off of this. So I always got to give credit to that event. Mm -hmm, but if you're mm -hmm. talking about like like performances or like artists that I've worked with, it's tough, you know. I, doing Nipsey Hussle's last tour, you know, doing the Victory Lap tour and working with with Nipsey Hussle, like that's special because I didn't work with Tupac, I didn't work with Biggie. So you know, being able to be up close with Nipsey and doing his tour was really meaningful. Camilla there was probably my favorite one, though, I would say. Really? Yeah, the nigga that I I showed that blue Chevelle to. We got to talk about that Chevelle that I pulled up on <laughs> Onyx on that boy on, and he remember me. He gonna have to because I gave him the business. <laughs> yeah, old school classic, man. It, it wasn't a Caprice though. I started mm -mm. tum tum that nigga, but mm -hmm. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, so why did why did the why did the chameleon one stick out so? Much? I would say because at that time, you know, he was someone that coming into the industry, like I. I identified with, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't like- he dope, man. He was just a skilled artist, but he was very smart. And you could tell. You could uh, tell. Even now. Even now. Uh, but he was just different. He he spoke a different language. Then, you know, you had a lot of the rappers coming up at the time. They were all kind of rapping about the same stuff. You know, you know, nothing against the OGs in Texas, but like Cam was the one that was spitting and he was using the internet to his advantage. And he was just working in a way that was just unconventional. It had never been seen. He was leveraging his social media before social media was a thing. And I just, I, I admired him so much. So when I finally got to work with him and I sold it out in, in, in the city, like it was just meaningful to me. It wasn't the most nope. attended event. It definitely didn't make me the most money, but it, it meant more to me than that. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah. I would say that one was- Shout yeah. out to Chameleon there, man. Like mm -hmm. I say, man, every time I met him, every time I seen him, he acknowledged, uh, E CEO, but it was really just E at the time. And uh he just a dope dude all together. He hey, was, man, and you he know was sharp as hell. And you know what? Uh I you know, I talked about August sixth, I got the show coming up and I got three six mafia. Camilla is actually on the show as well. And he here's another exclusive da da da. Uh, Give he, it up, man. He he told everybody at the Houston Rodeo from what I was told and what was communicated to me that August sixth is gonna be his last show ever. Wow. So, because he doesn't do shows anymore. No, you he don't do no that, shows. Right? So when I announced him, people were going crazy. Like, how the fuck did you get Camilla in there? I'm like, he mm -hmm. likes me. I guess I don't know. You know what I mean? Wow. And that's the last show. Yeah, but he, his last solo show was in Fort Worth with me in 2015. He did a few spot dates, but, but it wasn't like that. He he hadn't done a solo show. This one, you know, he agreed to do it, and, and I really don't know why he agreed to do it. But he's on on the August 6th show. All right, yeah, I'm Who gonna try to get him in again. Here we go again. <laughs> I'm trying to get that nigga over here, man. <laughs> the show. Who else is on? Uh, I got three six mafia. I got a, you know, me being, you know, Latin. Obviously, I wanted to have a Latin presence on the show, so I have uh, GT Garza. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Netflix show Rhythm and Flow, but the runner up on that show his name is Flawless Real Talk. He's on the show as well. Uh, Little Flip, Tum Tum actually gonna be on the show as well. Shout so. out Little Flip and Tum Tum. And any Texas natives, you know, I get excited, mm. you know. I yeah. brush my shoulders up, you know. You can't believe in these, these cats from out of state that come in this town and yeah. call themselves, uh, you know, uh, doing all this stuff that they doing. And I ain't gonna call <laughs> no names, you know, but they know who they are. You know what I'm saying? But hey, man, uh, so I seen you with the, the Joe Budden and that whole, you yeah, know, before they man. broke up, you know. Uh, no. uh, yeah, yeah, they broke up. And you was up there with them before they they broke up. Was you the reason they broke up? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I knew that. I knew it was that. That's an exclusive. Boss talking. <laughs> so how did you end up with those guys? Uh, no, man. Uh, man, I, I owe a lot to them guys, to be okay. honest with you. Like, um, I'm actually, they're going to be in town the first week of May as well, too. So, man, them niggas, man. Is it the white guy that you so caught up with? Because y'all, I figured that. 
No, man. So, <laughs> meddling like so yeah. the, when I when I left, I left doing events for a long. So you were time. rocking with them for real, for real, like yeah. on the show with them, or I was how was it? I wasn't on the show. What it was was that I went a long period of time where I I left doing live events after my kids were born, and I just went and worked a nine to five because that's what society makes you think you need to do. So I did what I thought society wanted me to do. So for five years, I worked a retail job, and I was away from doing live music. I would do it in spots, but I wasn't doing it full time. The very first event I decided to come back with was I booked Joe Budden as a rapper. Mm. And when I booked him as a rapper, I, I enjoyed his music, which a lot of people don't really, they're not up on his music like that. I thought he was dope. So I booked him as an artist, not really realizing that he was starting the podcast journey. And I established, a, I got in early, I established a relationship with his manager. And to this day, the guy that was acting as his manager then is still a really close friend of mine. And we just, we just formed a partnership and a friendship and a mentorship. So I've, I've maintained a relationship with them. And so they've shouted me out several times on the podcast. Really? Yeah. And then in 2000, and I say 19, one of the guys that was on the podcast, I don't know how well you know it, but his name's Maul. I brought him out to Fort Worth and we did a master class for like podcasters and people that were aspiring to be podcasters. And he's actually the one. We went out to eat in Fort Worth at Papados, and he's the one who's like, you need to start a podcast. And two wow. days later, I started my podcast. Dope, wow. man, dope. But those yeah. guys had a hell of a chemistry too while they were together. Yeah. Um, I like the chemistry of that podcast and uh, they, like I said, they ended up breaking up, didn't they? Yeah, but they, they you know, they, they still cool. They're still though. Yeah, they got a, they got a new like a new cast, I guess you would say. But like the core of the guys are still there. But I still have a relationship with those guys to with this those day. Guys. So uh, that you know, I think that's one lesson to be learning. All of this, you know, with, if you spend money and you do it right and you do good business, you know, you can you become a repeat customer and eventually you could create real create, relationships. Really. That's what I was gonna ask you. How hard is it to create those um, real relationships? Is it just business and be like yeah it's done or do you keep connections i think it's it's based off of your intent right like if you go in with the intent just to do the show it'll be just a show but if you go in with the intent to create a real relationship you can leverage that for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and i feel like if you do good business if you spend money one time you never have to spend money with that person again wow. if you do it the right way that's true and wow. i think a classic case of that was like flip for a long time you know i, I did a show with flip in 2008 and by the end of 20 2009 2010 i was you know i was handling all his business affairs I was taking care of all his digital distribution. I literally had all his information to where I could call the bank as a little flip, like, cause I had his social, his ID, I had, it. I had his fucking identity, and, but he trusted me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he never screwed him over. Never, never had to, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Because, you know, at the end of the day- That's a good relationship. Because at that time, like I didn't, you know, you gotta remember when you're young and you're trying to break into the business, you wanna learn. And if mm -hmm. you have the intention to really come in and, and, and last, like that was my school. Like I went to the school of like little flip. I went to the school of like working with some of these guys early on, but to back to Joe Budden, he was the first artist I ever worked with. Like as far as like back whenever I started the new version of my promotion company. And those guys walked me into the, the agencies, which was like, that's a really hard world to walk mm -hmm. into. Cause you talk about, you know, uh, the, the light skin complexion for the yeah, connection. Yeah, I'm that guy, you the, know. The yeah, complexion yeah, for the yeah, connection. Yeah, the complexion is for the connection a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, I believe if I was a little lighter, nigga, I'd get more. Like, if I was your button color, oh, man. <laughs> oh, man, Boss Talk would have been and took off. But you, but, but I'm a little too dark, so, you know, they got the brother over here, you know. And, yeah, we got the setup, and Boss Talk 101 is a thing, but it, it, it's, it's on its way. No, but I would say that... Uh, <laughs> No, truth be told, like you, you, you know, across the across the region, you know, across these music venues, across the national agencies, like there is a protocol on how this music game works yeah. on the live music side. There is absolutely no minorities in position. Wow! Like I've I've worked with all the general managers across town, wow. like you know, I, I, across the region, across Texas, Real spiel. and I've never seen a Mexican in position. I've never seen a black man in position, and and it's hard because when you're talking about hip hop, right, and we're talking mm. about the culture. Like, how can people that aren't part of the culture identify with the culture, right? right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it's foreign to them. And so they treat you as if it's foreign. And it's very hard to break in. But wow. in their mind, they hire people for the culture to deal with that part of it. They don't. You see what I mean? They don't, though. They don't. They, they, they legitimately are, like, people that have no knowledge of this. You know what I'm saying? And they're, ba they're banking on people that they, they, they grow relationships with as time goes on. But it's very difficult to break in in that sense. So it, it, if it wasn't for Joe Budden and his team, 
if it wasn't maybe for like Chino Excel and Immortal Technique, these guys that Royce the Five Nine that walked me in, like I don't know that I would have been anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people would be like, well. You'll hear certain promoters, right? They'll be like, oh, you know, I know the managers and I know this person, I know that person, but that shit is fucking limited. And the, and the people that are, are doing it, like mom and pop, independent, without agencies, they cap out at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and, and when you talk about working with like the bigger artists and you start talking about working with like national recording acts that are current, like you have to go through the protocol. Yeah. yeah, because I think I was, I was reading 50 Cent new book, and he even said that, um, I can't remember exactly what situation, but he had to be walked into a room, although he was 50 Cent, but into a certain type of room that wasn't even a hip-hop when he was going into business with other people. I think it, at some point you do, if that's what you're aiming for, if that's what your goal is. Yeah. Um, I, I think you can control the narrative to your happiness. Um, mm -hmm. A, a yeah. lot of people are trying to get to certain certain levels, but at the end of the day, I think you can do whatever um, God permits you to do. I don't want to, you know, bust your bubble, but there are no rules when it comes down to, you know, we we walk in purpose again. Let me say that. Yeah. No. So so I don't think. Yeah, they can they can hold you back. People can hold you back, but when you mentally know who you are and you have self awareness, you 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 achieve goals that other people would never even imagine in your mind. To be honest with yeah, you, yeah, I know I know what you're saying. I get it, but I don't even want to be in some of those rooms, man. No, I feel what you're saying, but I'm talking more so like. Let's look at it from this standpoint. There's a stigma that comes with hip hop, right? Okay. The very first time I had ever walked into a room, I'm talking about 2002. I was 17 years old. I walk into the Ridgely Theater in Fort Worth, and God bless their souls. They're, I don't think they're alive anymore, but Richard and Wesley that owned the, the, the Ridgely Theater, I walked in and I tell them, hey, I want to do a hip hop show. I didn't know anything. I'm 17 years old, super ambitious. I'm walking in with a CD, like, look, I do music. I want to do a show. And they hit me with the most outrageous quote, like, oh, it's going to be $5,000 to yeah, rent the room. Yeah. It's going to have, you're going to have to have 12 police yeah. officers and this, wow. that, and the third. Because in their mind, they're, they're two older, elderly white people that associate hip hop with fuck the police NWA. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they think it's about to be, you know what I'm saying, yeah. the fucking they 80s try. all over again. And and it's not that, you know, like not every, like hip hop comes in different, you know, shapes, right, sizes, and forms. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like, it was really like, when when I was prepared pretty early on for that, you know what I mean? So that's at 17. So as I got older, I was already used to being, like, having to prove myself and being rejected and, you know, knowing that, like, y'all motherfuckers don't get this. Like, y'all don't understand this world at all. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I don't, you're right, I control my own narrative. Like, if I have to work with the regional artists to work my way into working with the national artists, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it at a high level and I'm going to continue right. to do it even if, certain people come along because there's been a lot of people that have come in and out of this game, right? And I'm, I'm, firm, I'm a firm believer that you come in the way that, you leave the way you come in. Mm -hmm. You come in fast, you leave fast, right? So there's a lot of people that get D-boy money, they get D-boy investors, they come in, they do a big show and then they think that they're, they're winning and then they go away because they were just here for the lick. They're not here for the long term. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, that's never been my goal. You know what I'm saying? My goal is to be here long term for as long as I can be here. You That's Smooth Vega, man. Smooth Vega just showed us how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, this <laughs> ended up being a captivating interview. I can see it. I know already it's going to be a good one. Yeah. All right. You did a good job, man. No, I appreciate it. I'm going to ask you one more question, man. Top three artists of all time, dead or alive. Or top three promoters. A top three promoters? Yeah. I don't oh, know. That's, I'm an that's artist. Easy. I, I can, don't want to answer He's like, that. he's uh, like, that's I'm easy. I'm an artist. I'll answer both. Okay, I'll answer his and then I'll answer yours. Okay. Tupac. Okay, number two. Uh, number two, uh, Scarface. Man, he's the same as the other nigga. Let's go. The third. <laughs> I want to see that. That nigga say Drake, I'm going to get him walk up out this. Okay? No, 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 Drake, no, he no. said. What did he say? I'll tell you. Oh, Ice Cube. He just no, nah, man. Oh, I know exactly what it was. Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg. That's dope. Mm -hmm. I like it. I yeah, like it. That's Snoop Dogg. So uh, now answer mine. Uh, Vince McMahon. Dead or alive? Vince Top McMahon. Three. Okay. Number one, Vince McMahon. Uh, number two... Bob Aaron boxing top rank. Uh, number three. Woo, that's a good one. Mm. I'm going to probably stick with promoter. I'm going to say Al Heyman. I, I don't know anybody. That's dope. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Why Vince for McMahon? He, revolution, he revolutionized live entertainment. He, you think about it even now, you put it into perspective. He's my, he's my biggest business influence, right? He, he, he introduced pay-per-view to the world. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of live events, you know, at one point they were running 200 live events a year and they were averaging an attendance of like 6,600. So he was banking, you know, and not only that, but to be able to be doing this for as long as he's done it, you know, he started WrestleMania in 1984, mm-hmm. 85, and it's 2022 and they're about to do AT&T Stadium at what, like in, in a week and a half, you know what I mean? So uh, to see what he's been able to do with what he's been given to work with, it's fucking, it's unbelievable. He, he's I a self-made, you. he's a self-made billionaire. And right. The way he did it was by betting on himself. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So I've studied this story long enough. Super dope. You know what I'm saying? Wow. That's cool. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. We love you, bro. No, I appreciate, we appreciate you, appreciate you, man. You no, smooth, thank baby. you. No, thank hey, you. man, the way we bring you in, I don't care where else you go, nigga. This is the one. <laughs> uh, we the one regardless of what you think. No. We the one. You know what I mean? <laughs> Right? Yes, sir. Tell you that when you're with somebody, they know you the one. I got to convince her. I really don't care what you think, really. <laughs> no, I appreciate you guys. No, thank you so no, much, Thank man. you for coming, man. No, I appreciate like it. Like I said, I hope I hope this ain't the last time. And anytime, anytime you rocking out and you want to push something out, man, know that we over here, bro. And we, we, we definitely, we here for the people, right? And we'll put out your event dates. August That's 6th, right. August 6th, August, 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 August 6th, be ready, man, Three, it's going five, down. Yeah. Come in there, I got your but tickets, you got one I'm going to get your tickets, man. Yeah, for sure. You got one in May, well, too. The, the, the one in May is actually, I, so I act as an agent sometimes oh, where okay. I'll, I'll basically, I'll book talent for, for promoters and my friend's promoting an event. And I got a project pack coming for him. So, oh, okay. man. So, hey, you gotta, I'm you in there. Let me in. You got to let me in here, man. I'm in the time. I got you, bro. Hey. You say, man, we got you, man. I, I I guess I asked you the one more question because it, it keep coming to me. How was it meeting Nipsey Hussle? I met him. I, I met him uh, on occasions in Vegas. Uh, how was it for you when you met him? And uh, just uh, what did that mean to you? I, I mean, at the time, I don't know that I uh, I realized the magnitude of what, of what it would become because I, I booked, I met him prior to the tour, then during the tour, and then after the tour, the last appearance he made was a month before he passed in wow. Dallas. It was. And I booked his after party at that nightclub uh, in, near downtown. Okay. Uh, but I established a working relationship with his team. Okay. And uh, even after he passed, we talk about the podcast, uh, his, his manager, uh, actually the first interview that they did after his passing was with me, and he hadn't done anything in reference to, you know, Nipsey, yeah, but... See. Being around him was unique. And I just remember like this guy reminds me so much of like Snoop. You know okay. what I'm saying? And yeah. I and I think Snoop's like he's transcended, he obviously, right? You know, he just said like the Super Bowl. So like being around him was very like now I look back on it, it was it was an experience. Yeah, I didn't I when I met him he was he was this was after he, I think it was after no, it was before he slapped the old boy. Yeah, you know, it was on the BET award. Oh yeah, show. what did you meet him at? I met him in Vegas, in Vegas at the Palms Hotel. Oh really? Yeah, me and him were just booking in. I meet a lot of people like that, but at the end of the day, it was just a time where because he owned the store, we went to his store too. And you, all you want me to tell you before what, that? The, the thing that stood out to me, two things that stood out to me that I always tell people is that one, uh, at my event, I was the promoter, and you know, as a promoter, you know, I I play various roles, but I also have people that are assisting me, people that are runners. Runners are essentially people that go and go get the water, go get this, go mm-hmm. get that. They bring them, bring them, bring them. And I noticed that there was someone that was working for me at the time and they were doing all the work. Like they were doing all the like running around. And at the end of the, <laughs> at the, end of the promotion, uh, Nipsey and him exchanged contacts and he followed the, the guy that was running around. He didn't follow me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he yeah. He yeah. followed him, but I, I know why because he saw him busting his ass off and I thought that was really cool. And then the last time that I'd ever seen him, Gio, who happens to be the program director at K104, he was at the after party. He walks in and he made it a point to like go out of his way to say hi to him. Now, mind you, the very first time I met him, he had an industry mixer that he was doing in every market. And these industry markers were only, these industry, uh, like mixers were only for influencers. So it'd be like only podcasters, DJs, radio station, uh, people, people that were like influencers in the market. And he, he, he threw a party for them at Top Golf. He did it in multiple cities, but he did it in Dallas. Mm-hmm. So I noticed like just the way he moved, rather than putting marketing money in uh, a radio campaign, he was putting marketing money going directly to the people that influence the people. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and he valued those people and those were the people that were his allies. And I saw that just at his, in, in the way he moved instantly. Wow. Hey, you know? man, look out, man. Hey, man, I th- like I said, it's a dope show, man. Mm-hmm. Love the relationship that you built, man, the things that, the way that you moved in your in your purpose, man. Loved it. Um, 
Can't wait till we do this again. For sure. Thank you for coming on Boss Talk 101. Absolutely, man. Thank you. And you really deserve to be in that seat where the boss is talking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Holla at your boy, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. And we have.